Ava Vidal, comedian, journalist, presenter. Welcome to Tell a Friend. Hiya. It's actually Ava. Ava, Ava sorry. Like an old white lady. Ava. So, <laughs> so obviously, uh, the last time we spoke um, was in the height of the pandemic. Uh, so I just wanted to know, you know, two years on, you know, how are you doing? How are things with you? Okay, I'm getting I'm getting there. Getting back to normal. Um, yeah, everything's all right. Now, obviously for this uh, profile interview, I wanted to talk about your incredible career. And, you know, when I was preparing uh, for this interview, I stumbled across a fact of yours that I didn't know beforehand, that you had actually worked as a prison officer before you oh, entered you know entertainment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, oh, you know, you. that... Yeah, that was striking to me. And, you know, I just wanted to, you know, dive right in and just ask you about that experience. And, you know, what was it like? It was actually quite good fun most of the time. Um, it was interesting. I'm, I'm like a real people watcher. Um, I will sit in a restaurant and make, make up whole stories about how people met, um, what they're talking about, what they're fighting about you know, on the are they first date, like I just make up whole backstories. I think that comes into like me being a writer as well. So I think sort of being a prison officer and getting all those stories and chatting so much to people about what they'd done, you know, it was completely different coming from boarding school and then ending up at that job. So it was just interesting, just talking, getting life stories, learning a lot. And, and obviously, um, after you left, um, well, bef before you went to uh, comedy, you went back to school and you were uh, studying law. And, you know, uh, after that, from watching the documentary that was um, made about, about you and your career, you made, you know, the sudden jump into entertainment and comedy. So I wanted to ask, you know, with the shift in career, you know, being so drastic, obviously from being a prison officer to uh, working in entertainment. Have you always been someone who has taken, you know, these brave and bold risks, you know, when it comes to your life, when it comes to your career? Yeah, I suppose so. I suppose I'm not really a planner. I just do what I want to do. I wouldn't even say it was that much of a shift, to be honest. I think it depends on what kind of person you are. So I think to... Like, I remember, I, I often say I learned about heckling, how to deal with hecklers in the prison service, being a woman in a man's prison. I remember a prison officer, um, this Irish guy saying to me, just like they were shouting all sorts of crap at me. And he was like, answer, answer. I was like, and say what? He goes, it doesn't matter what you say, say something. And you're gonna get better and better at it as time goes on. That's literally how you deal with a heckler. You, you you can't say nothing because they smell blood in the same way an inmate would smell blood. They know when you're scared, they know when you're freaking out inside and they're not gonna show you any mercy. So to me, um, it wasn't that big of a jump. Also, you know, sometimes you end up in situations with people where you have to think really, really quickly and you have to get your way out of it. Like I remember being cornered in an exercise yard by this guy and he was just chatting to me and it was like a big exercise yard and it's like triangle shape. They put an officer at every corner, but they're quite far away. And um, you got a radio, but then he was talking to me. And as he started talking to me, I realized he was not okay. And I was like, oh, oh. And then he was just starting, I, I can actually remember it really clearly. He said, um, he was just talking normally. He was going, yeah, Miss Vidal, yeah, Miss Vidal, about the Queen. He's, well, probably I shouldn't say it, but he said some preference in bed he thought the Queen might have that was quite eye-watering. And he didn't change tone. He didn't change um, facial expression, nothing. So I was like waiting for him to laugh. He did not laugh. And he was badgering me for an answer. And I was like, okay, I have to get myself out of this. And if I radio nobody's gonna to get to me on time. Like they're gonna to have to run across, he's gonna know that I radio, so I need to get him away from me right now. <laughs> so I just had to act like I was crazier than he was. And he left. 
so there you you talk about how uh, obviously your previous job had prepared you uh, going into comedy and you know being able to kind of stand your ground in that environment but something else that I've always uh, been interested in is you know well obviously to be black in any industry you know you face a lot um but comedy especially you know what when you know we still don't see that many uh, black and brown faces um you know making it high up in comedy or being given those kind of opportunities what was it like for you going in as a black woman into this industry did you feel welcomed or was it like an exclusive club no not feel welcome not at all um it is an exclusive club um but it is different now there are quite a few coming up and i really uh, appreciated working uh, with dane baptiste recently and he said that i paved the way for a lot of them i think the comedy was just very different before i came along it was a very different style um i think like generation before us i guess were two generations before us, I guess, were the real McCoy people. Then after that was the um, Jeannie Asherays, uh, Rudy Liquids, um, his Miles Crawford. Um, they were just different, different styles. Like what I was doing was not really done by any black person before. Um, I think they had boxes they wanted to put us in. And I think, so like we had like the Ninia Benjamins, the Jocelyn G's just before us, who were quite loud, speak very fast, um, very, very London. Um, it was just really different to me. Um, so I think it, it took, people were just, oh, who's she and what she's saying? And her stories are quite different. So I think there was that, but now there's it's like, a wealth of, uh, there's a few uh, privately educated black people on the circuit. There's a few of them. They don't all admit it though, but there are a few of them. So yeah, there's like now behind me, there's the Danes, Sophie Duca, is it Duca? Duca, it's Duca, isn't it? Um, Athena, uh, who else? Nabil Abdul Rashid. Um, there's just a generation that's different. So you all sort of see things change as they go along, you know? So you've got now, um, Jeannie was doing all the Nigerian stuff, but Nabil actually is Nigerian, like was raised in Nigeria, even though he was born here. So the comedy that he does is very different to what she would say about Nigeria, like he is it. So he, he brings a completely different, a new perspective on it, I think the the generation coming up behind us are less apologetic than the generation before me were. Um, so yeah, it's good. It's all good. And you know, thinking about some of those names, you know, a lot of them are my favourites. You know, like the Jocelyn, um, you know, Ninia Benjamin, um, Gina as well. Do you ever look at you know people from that group and even look at yourself? and think that you've been kind of let down by comedy in this country? Because, you know, when we're thinking about opportunities that are given for shows, you know, is that something you feel? I don't really care. <laughs> I don't care. I don't think that, you know, I, I think I, the way that I've always done stuff is I find a way. I've always, mm -hmm. always found a way to do what I want to do. So when there's something that I want to do, I'll find a way of doing it. To be honest, there hasn't, there's been a couple of times people wanted to do a sitcom with me or wanting to do something else with me and it just was never right. So I'm not bothered. And also, what do you think about this uh, conversation that, um, again, to go back to Gina or to think of people like London Hughes, you know, you hear them talking about how um, there's more opportunity uh, what well, they found there was more opportunity for them to go to America and be recognized. And you kind of see a similar pattern when it comes to music. You know, you see a lot of black uh, musicians and recording artists going to America and then, you know, making it a lot bigger than when they were here. Is that something that, you know, a trend that you've noticed as well? 
I don't really care what anyone else does. I'm not interested. I don't really know those people. So I don't know. I mean, I'm happy. They can, they do what they do. I do what I do. Mm -hmm. But so now if, we, if we're looking, you know, as you alluded to uh, just a second ago about the new talent that's coming up. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously you see the success of shows like Chewing Gum and you see, you know, so many black people being amplified. Um, does this give you hope for, you know, the way that black voices are going to be recognized? And do you think that what's been happening in the past two years with BLM has kind of helped the black community, you know, be propelled in entertainment? No, BLM didn't do anything, no. Didn't, it just, people put up a few black squares on Instagram and on Twitter. I got a couple of diversity gigs out of it, like, like lecturing diversity gigs, and that was, like, people have forgotten about all of that right now. They're not interested anymore. Everyone's, like, anti-woke, which just means anti-black, basically. And, um, no, they're, they're always going to be, there's always going to be the racism. They're always going to find different ways of doing it. White supremacy is very adaptable. It adapts, it changes, it's a chameleon, it will change its way. If you can no longer say, oh my, you know, you can no longer have Love Thy Neighbour with Alf Garnet, so they'll find another way of doing it. And then they'll find another way of doing it. And even if that means having black people actually say the racist stuff, they'll do it that way. Then there'll be BLM and they'll be quiet for a minute and they'll be like, oh my God, this is so terrible. And now what are they all doing? They're trying to fight wokeism. So, you know, they're going to find different ways to do it. You just got to change, you know, if you want to change your stuff, then you do that. Now, if we, if we shift the conversation um, uh, on from, from comedy, uh, obviously the last time I interviewed you, um, it was for a Vice article and we were talking about uh, the Black British um, Twitter space. And obviously on Twitter, you know, as you've always been, you know, you're very outspoken, you know, you uh, give your political I've comments. I've grown, Brian, recognise my growth. <laughs> but I wanted to ask you, you I don't know, tell people about them <laughs> what, what, what's your experience like obviously being a, a very visible um you know black woman on a space like Twitter and you know not just Twitter you know you give television commentary um you know what is it like being that visible and outspoken it's to be honest, in the last couple of years, I've had to realise how visible I am mm. and really take that on board and take on board that younger black people look up to me and adjust my behaviour accordingly. So I will not be swearing on Twitter. I will more likely block you. I've just got too much going on. I also have to realise that some people want to be friends with you on Twitter and they are not your friend at all. I just got to be a lot more careful in who I trust most definitely. That's what I have learned since, yeah, we last spoke. <laughs> and and would you say you, you still feel that uh, you have a community around you, obviously thinking specifically about Twitter, do you feel that there does exist this, you know, supportive Black British, you know, Twitter space um, that you can really Absolutely. share ideas with. Absolutely. And I think more in the last couple of years, it's been a lot of black women and um, that have really, really rallied around, especially with the spaces coming up on Twitter, which mm -hmm. is sort of like Clubhouse seems to have moved to Twitter. There's a lot of uh, black women that will watch your back and take care of you and comfort you and you can have these spaces together where you can talk and get on and it's good it's really good we just gotta um yeah I'm, I'm, I'm realizing a lot of people pretend that they like black people on there or they will pretend you know they'll have blm in the bio or they'll tweet about oh gosh poor black women poor black women and they are the vilest people on there so i think that we are recognizing we will pick up for each other you know, um, a couple of, I think they were both in your last interview as well, Aloni and Kalechi. Yeah. So I think somebody called for the extermination the other day and that raised up 6,000 people just like that in a Twitter space that same night. Like they're not having it anymore. 
and won't stand for it um, at all to have people disrespecting black women in that way. We will have each other's backs. And I think there has been um, a kind of war between a lot of, because of all these podcasts that are coming up um, since we last spoke, um, run by black men that are just disgusting and disrespectful and a real waste of their mum's internet. And, you know, kind of building on that, and with this next question, um, you know, feel free to elaborate or say as little um, as you want on it. You know, in the past few weeks, we've seen, you know, these incel communities, um, especially in, in the Black British uh, Twitter space. And, you know, like you said, there's been spaces, you know, collective has been very, um, you know, outspoken on there. You've spoken in some of the Twitter spaces. When all of this has been coming out, um, has, you know, have you been surprised by this or is this just, you know, what have you been making, uh, obviously the incident and obviously the reaction that black women have had to it and the way that they've really, um, you know, fought back online? I mean, like I said, black women are not having it anymore. I think with these spaces, I think the black ones are called nick cells actually. My friend told me that. <laughs> yeah. I love that one. <laughs> Little nick cells. So cute. Sounds cute. I um, I mean, what are they doing? It's it's really some hateful stuff, and they deserve everything they get. Mm-hmm. Somebody calls you out, and some girl put up her maintenance statement to show this man who's got a podcast talking about his kids and stuff wasn't even paying paying something like thirty pound a month for his child. It was something like thirty two ninety nine. He asked for the two ninety nine off. I mean, honestly, I just I I really hope and pray that there is some kind of cohesion between black women and um, black men um, as my daughter is growing up in this. I don't wanna, I really hope, because the way these uh, younger women are going out and slaying it anyway, I think by that point, either black men will be extinct or they'll have learned to watch their mouths basically. And I hope so because it's stupid at this point, criticizing skin color and stuff it's interesting but I think that's just normal isn't it because I think it's just like the women are growing so much through Twitter and social media and the men seem stunted the the cishet men do anyway gay men are always cool bi men are cool trans men are cool the rest of them are trash sorry but they um the rest are just not you know I don't know why they're not learning really some of the stuff is really really hateful and Mm -hmm. I really hope that they can um uh learn from it i mean we're hoping i was doing a podcast during lockdown called black woman's hour which um at the moment it was like quite good because it was online it was during lockdown and stuff like that but now it's coming to be summer and stuff we're looking for venues if anyone's watching we are looking for venues to do it live and one of the first topics that we want to tackle is this black men black women thing but you know like i said i have grown so um even when i speak in spaces now we do try to speak and have solutions and stuff. Because I think like what's going on is um, really, really quite ugly. And then a lot of times I hear what's going on. I think, wow, it would have taken the dial to turn that little bit because you're not hearing him and he's not hearing you. And I'm hearing both of you, but it's like the message is going like that. And, Mm -hmm. And I just think we can do better than this. I think we will. Well, let's hope so. I mean, I mean, what what what's been really striking to me is um, just how stupid, you know, especially this uh, case that we're talking about in in the past two weeks. You know, a, you're saying all of this in a community space, but you know, you're you're <laughs> you know, they rushed with their vitriol and didn't even realize that other people could see inside that community. And yeah, I Maybe mean, I, yeah, that's like a good thing, I think. Um, that they didn't realise that they could be seen. It's kind of like, I guess, being really, really light-skinned and passing and people making racist comments in front of you. It was kind of like that. (laughs) You hear what they say when you're not around. So Mm. I think that that needed to be heard. I think it really definitely needed to be heard what they were really saying and what they really think. Because a lot of these guys need Mm counselling. They need a lot of help. They need to listen to gay men a lot more. I mean, I'll I'll move our conversation on because, you know, the primary reason why I really wanted you on the show 
um, is because I wanted you to speak about um, your upcoming live show, which I've got my tickets to, Arva oh, Vidal and Friends. Yes, I'll be joining you on Thursday. Um, and this isn't the first show that you've done. And, uh, you know, like I said, it's a live chat show. You have it um, held at the Royal uh, Vauxhall Tavern. Uh, so could you talk yeah. to me and my audience about how the idea for the show came about? And uh, yeah, just speak a little bit more about it. Um, I've always wanted to do something like that. I mean, I kind of did something similar before, but it wasn't, um, you know, where I was just hosting a show. Like I had um, a show in Bedford where I live, where I would bring comedians down and I would be the MC, and then they would just do their stand up and I'd sort of talk in between it. And then, um, so the first one I did was like that. It was me, a couple of drag queens. Um, I think it was just me and two drag queens actually. And then as COVID hit and we couldn't have so many people in, it was decided it was just gonna be a chat show so that people were sitting down in seats on the stage, socially distancing. And then kind of got the idea to get, um, I was having in between my, my podcast, Black Woman's Hour, I was having politicians on that anyway, like Clive Lewis, Nadia Whittam, whatever. My dream was to get Diana Abbott, which we did. Another dream is to get Jeremy Corbyn, which please, <laughs> I hope nothing goes wrong. So it'd be Jeremy Corbyn we'll be having. I have been watching Tan Desai for quite a while. Uh, Tan Desai is a, um, a Sikh, actually Sikh community, Tommy, it's pronounced Sikh. So this a Sikh MP um, who is just amazing. He's really amazing. And I think the first time I noticed him was when he was telling Boris Johnson to apologize for mm. calling Muslim women bank robbers. It was like literally, it was just like a mic drop moment where he was saying, you're not gonna call us that, we're not having it. You just got a turban on my head or someone might wear this, we don't deserve to be called ragheads, we don't deserve to be called pillar boxes. And it was just like literally, I know that, I mean, honestly, and there was a point where he just got an applause break and he looked quite gangster. And I always think of um, sick people as being quite gangster because I used to train with one till I self defense classes was one. I didn't realize how bad ass they were. And so I was just like, yes, I love him. He gave another speech. He just gives these like um, groundbreaking speeches all the time. He spoke uh, about Boris Johnson and the um, National Borders Bill. And he was speaking and he said, why is he getting a brown person to do his dirty work? And I think with the exit of Jeremy Corbyn, there was like a mass exodus of voices on the left all the Jeremy Corbyn type people like Richard Bergen, Diane Abbott went to the back benches again, John McDonnell, we're not really hearing from them. Um, they're still quite ridiculed in the press. So to see a voice like that um, just come into parliament, I think, oh gosh, he might kill me. I think he came in 2017, I think he did. And um, yeah, he was just amazing. I really, I, and then I've had Zara on my show, Zara Sultana, another yeah. amazing voice. Another great one. Um, she's absolutely brilliant and she tolerates a lot. Nadia Whittam's been down on my show. Um, had people like Owen Jones. And then we have, you know, fun people. At, oh, gosh. I was gonna say, we have fun people as well. That sounds awful. Um, but, I mean, we have, like, you know, people who are not so much political. We've had um, uh, Asifa Lahore. Who was uh, had a documentary about her um, Muslim first Muslim drag queen, Britain's first Muslim drag queen. We've had John Thomas, who is an X-rated entertainer. Who, um, yeah, I'm the best friend of every gay man I know. When he was coming on my show, I'm like, oh, come on, just get a number, get a ticket, get a number. I was like, he's got an OnlyFans, use that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, we had Crystal from Drag Race UK. Okay. We've just had some, yeah, we've had some fun people down. It's always and, a really and, fun night. And you've worked, obviously, uh, throughout your career on different platforms and with different formats. Do you find uh, that you prefer, you know, doing that kind of live audience interaction rather than, you know, let's say something, the studio based or like a podcast one-to-one? -one? Yeah, I do, because simply we just don't have lawyers running through our stuff. 
people don't realize when you do a studio based thing even if it's a live thing they do go through it with a researcher like even if you're doing a radio even if you're doing lbc the researcher calls first they want to know exactly well this is what they do to me i'm assuming they do mm -hmm. it to everyone else they want to know exactly what you're going to say they want to know what your bullet points are they want to you know they might tell you not to say this or not to say that it's completely live and it's really really good fun and um we don't record it it's off the cuff mm -hmm. so people can really really relax diane abbott was a scream she is so quick and so funny really really funny i just was so flattered to have her there and then i will um have you know prominent people from the lgbt community to come up um like we had matthew hodson from aids map we had we've had activists you know that will come along as well because mm -hmm. i think it, with it being a very established lgbt community uh venue that we need to have people. So we've had like Louis Cipher, who is a drag king, um, who was in the West End in Death Drop. Um, so yeah, we like to have that kind of mix of people together. And just to remind everyone, so it's gonna be um, on this Thursday, Thursday the 12th of May. Um, and like you said, you've got Jeremy Corbyn, you've got Nick Charles, you've got Tan Desi, and you've got Nancy Kelly as well. And yeah, Nick Charles is a attitude cover boy. He's actually from Trinidad. He's got a really, really interesting story um, of how he was outed in Trinidad while it was illegal by his yeah. ex-boyfriend. Thank you. Could have got him killed, actually. Um, and he's just always wanted to work in radio and entertainment and he got over here and he's just living his dream. Really, really adore him. And he calls me mama and I love him. And um, we've got Nancy Kelly, who is the CEO of Stonewall. And obviously with everything that is going on with Stonewall, like the BBC um, not affiliating with them anymore and the division. So, you know, we like to keep things serious as well. We have to address the division that is going on in the LGBT community at the moment when it comes to trans rights and some people trying to cut the T off the LGBT. Um, mm. So yeah, we, we try and use that opportunity. So we're really, really grateful to welcome Nancy on Thursday. Okay, and something that I do with all of my guests is uh, I invite them to, uh, you know, complete the sentence in this quick fire round that I do. Um, so I'm gonna read the beginning of these sentences and just say whatever comes to your mind. The first one, the greatest misconception about me is, That I'm really loud and mean. My biggest regret. My biggest regret is not getting out of certain relationships and friendships quicker when the signs were there. Staying around thinking this is going to make great material while the person ruins my life. I'm most fearful of. I guess I'm really scared of, with rights being rolled back, mm -hmm. what is gonna happen to us as black people. Like, I'm seeing all the work that has been done by all minority communities, and I'm watching people from those communities strip them back. Like I just mentioned, LGBT community, and you're seeing people get up now as black people and like literally piss on what our ancestors did and piss on what our forefathers did. That makes me really scared. I am most proud of. I'm most proud of still standing, considering what I have been put through in life, especially in the last four years, and not and being in a madhouse. And finally, I want to be remembered for. I want to be remembered for making sense, really. People going, you know what, she had a point. She might have been sarcastic. She might have used bad words, but she had a point. Ava Vidal, thank you so much for joining me on my show. Thank you very much for having me.